powerful ways that we could get changes in so many of the worst environmental problems because a lot of the other factors that are contributing greatly to the environmental problems that we have aren't so easy to change. Getting here without a car, a little difficult for people on Long Island. Going through the winter without heat in your home, a little bit difficult as we've all learned a little bit in the recent past. Choosing differently at one or some of your meals, easy with major health benefits that go along with it. So that's why we do what we do. It's a very big mission, and as far as I see it, it's one that is coming more and more to the fore because the information is so powerful, just like climate change. More and more people are starting to get it because the information is so powerful and necessary to get that you can't hide the truth all the time from all the people. You can hide it from some of the time from some of the people. And on that note, <laughs> Eric scratches his head. Oh, he's just itchy. Uh, on that note, give me just a moment. Thank you, you're so patient. I'm not worthy. <laughs> I am really excited about tonight's speaker. And I really don't say this about many people, you've probably never heard me say it before, but uh, our speaker tonight is my hero. And uh, he is putting forth information on climate change in just the right way, without alienating people and really getting the message home, and again, speaking from a place of authority. He's a climate modeler at the NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies in New York, and is interested in modeling past, present, and future climate. He received a BA Honors in Mathematics from Oxford University, a PhD in Applied Mathematics from University College London. He has worked on education and outreach with the American Museum of Natural History and the New York Academy of Sciences. He has over 90 peer-reviewed publications and is the co-author with Josh Wolf of Climate Change, Picturing the Science, which is a collaboration between climate scientists and photographers and that book is here, and he will be signing them after this, the talk tonight. In 2011, he was awarded the first ever Climate Communications Prize from the American Geophysical Union, the largest organization of Earth and space scientists. This award recognizes excellence in climate communication, as well as the promotion of scientific literacy, clarity of messaging, and efforts to foster respect and understanding for science-based values related to climate change. They recognized him for his dedicated leadership and outstanding scientific achievements with the hopes that his work would serve as an inspiration to others. And he was on The Daily Show. So join me in welcoming Gavin Schmidt. Thank you very much. That was, uh, that was way too nice, uh, far more than I deserved. Um, thank you all for coming out uh, and, and staying past uh, dinner time. You know, it's, uh, I'm, uh, I think I'm here to help you digest, so I shall, uh, I shall try and be easy on your, on your stomach. Um, as Bob mentioned, uh, the, the book project that we worked on uh, was a collaboration between scientists and photographers. And Unlike what you might think, it wasn't the scientists going to the photographers saying, oh, take a picture of something science-y that, that we can explain. Uh, it, it was the other way around. The photographers came to us and they said, we want to tell a story with our art and our images that's more complicated than we're being allowed to do. Every time we have a, a, a climate story in Newsweek or Time, they want the same photograph. They want, a, they want a distressed penguin or a polar bear or a storm or something. We want to tell a more complicated story. We want to tell a more nuanced story. And you scientists should be able to help us do that. And after some pushing and prodding, we, yeah. ended, up, uh, we ended up doing that. So I'm, I'm going to give you a, a little bit of a, a, a flavor for these things. So there's no... There's, there's one graph in here, I think, but, uh, but mostly it's just pictures, uh, so uh, there's, there's very little to, uh, to worry about. Okay, let's see if this works. Yes? What is the beginning of a science? 
measurement. You have to be able to measure something. It's not good enough to say, oh, I feel something. You have to be able to measure it. Um, and climate science started when people started measuring temperatures. This is a, uh, a Galileo thermometer, so a thermometer invented by Galileo. It was the first quantitative thermometer uh, that existed. And basically what happens is that as it gets warmer and colder, the little balls move up and down. And for the first time, this is in the, the late 1500s, for the first time people could track whether how, how much one winter was different from another winter, how much temperature changed between summer and fall, uh, or between one country and another. And before that, we had, all we had was, was anecdotes, and, and it's very hard to make a science out of anecdotes. We do a better job now. We, we, can, go, uh, uh, we can go and write down these things. This is um, uh, for the space buffs. Uh, this is a logbook uh, that was written by Cassini, who the, the Saturn probe was named after. Uh, but at the time, he was the head of the uh, observatory in Paris, uh, and he would write down that it was cold, and this is in French, and he had to... It's really hard to work out exactly what he's writing down. Uh, but this is his weather notebook for, for that day. It was a cold winter's day in Paris. Um, and people are going back, and we're, and we're writing down these things. We're codifying this. We're trying to put together histories uh, of, the whole, uh, of the whole climate, as long as we've been writing these things down. Uh, and we're putting this together. What happens when we put it together? Um, we, uh, we, uh, we're not just putting it together now. We're, we're doing a much better job. Right? This is a, a weather station that's in... Antarctica. Uh, these are automatic weather stations. You don't need uh, astronomers to do this anymore. You don't need uh, fancy little balls floating in a little glass thing. These are, uh, they're all connected by satellites and uh, they keep track of the temperature, the rainfall, the snowfall, uh, the wind direction. Um, we have a pretty good network now. We have, we can, we've instrumented pretty much the entire surface of the planet. We have satellites uh, flying overhead, uh, looking at pretty much every part of the, uh, of, the, of the world. And what we find is, is a history like this. Now, you've probably seen graphs like this. Um, and this is really what we're talking about when we talk about global warming, right? So uh, it's worth thinking about what's on this graph for a little bit. Uh, this, is, uh, this is the late 1900s, right? So 1890, so this is 2010 here. 2011 is, uh, is just there. 2012 is going to be there. Um, and you can see that, you know, this is, this is temperature, so up is hot. Uh, it, was, it was colder, and then it kind of warmed up for a bit to the 1940s, the 1970s, and it was flat. And then since the 1970s, it's been warming. And that warming is continuing, and what we project is that that's going to continue uh, quite, uh, quite dramatically. Uh, but it's also worth noting that there's a lot of ups and downs. Like one year can be, like this can be a cold year, and that can be a warm year, and it can be a cold year, and it can be a warm year. There's a lot of noise in the system, right? We know that, right? We know that one winter and one summer, uh, they can be very different one from the other. Right? It's because we have the global warming pattern, it doesn't mean that every summer is hotter than the summer before, that every winter is, is not as warm, is not as cold as it was before. Um, and so we've got a lot of noise in the system, so pe teasing out the signal, teasing out what's going on in, on the large scale, is actually quite hard. The other thing that's worth noting here is the size of these uh, wiggles, right? Look at, the, look at the temperature change here. Now, this is in, in Celsius. I apologize for that. I'm still a little bit of a European at heart. I, uh, I, you've tried to beat it out of me, but it's, 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 it's very sticky. Um, so this is, uh, this is about uh, 2 degrees Fahrenheit. And so you can say, okay, well, hold on. You know, has it only gone up two degrees Fahrenheit since the 1900s? Why do we even care? Right? The temperature in this room has gone up by two degrees Fahrenheit just since we've been sitting here, right? Because we're we're producing about 100 watts uh, from our heads the entire time. We're we're, we're keeping this place uh, toasty warm, um, and you know, it's a little it's a little sweaty, but uh, but it's not you know ridiculously uncomfortable. Uh, so the question is, why why do we care? Why is this important? Right? Does the planet really notice this? I mean, we could have noticed it, right? Scientists could have noticed it, but does it matter? So that's, that's, a, that's a valid question. Does it matter? We can ask the planet. We can go to places on the planet where there's some kind of integrating force, where there's something that's 
that's there but doesn't pay attention to that noise. It doesn't pay attention to what's going on in one week or another week. But just pays attention to what's going on in the long term. And there's lots of places we can go. Uh, this, is, uh, this is in Canada. Uh, this is the Athabasca Glacier. Um, and uh, this is a picture taken in 1894. So right at the beginning of that, of that time series that I showed you. And we can go to this exact same spot today, and we can see what it looks like. Right? Now, do you like that? People, people like that. Take a deep breath. Right? Nobody took a deep breath when you saw the, 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 the time series in the graph. But when you see how things have changed, right? And I can go anywhere. I, I, anywhere where there's ice, I, I can do this same thing. I can go to the Rockies. I can go to the Andes in South America. I can go to Mount Kilimanjaro. I can go to the Himalayas. I can go to the Alps. I can go to the Caucasus. I can go to Papua New Guinea, where there are still some, uh, some glaciers really high up in the mountains. And I will see the same thing. If you show me a photograph from 100 years ago, and you go back and you go and look at it now, it is radically changed. Right? The planet's ice has noticed that the planet has got rumor. But it's not just the ice. Right? It's also the ecosystems. It's also the sea level. The planet has noticed what has happened. Um, some places have had very dramatic changes. This is a uh, satellite photograph of uh, an ice shelf uh, in the Antarctic Peninsula. So the Antarctic Peninsula is the bit of Antarctica that kind of pokes up towards South America. Right? And it's one of the places in the world that's warming up the fastest. And uh, just to give you a sense of scale, uh, this, uh, this ice shelf here is about the size of Rhode Island. Okay, that's not a small little bit of ice. Um, and uh, these, little, these little marks on the ice here, they're um, puddles, milk ponds, water just sitting on the top. Now that was an unusual thing. People said, oh, that's unusual. What's going on there? And over the next six weeks, uh, this is what's going on there. And so what happened was that entire ice shelf just disintegrated. That was floating ice. There was ice that was about 700 meters thick, um, all in one big thing. But it was floating on the, on the surface of the ocean. And uh, like I said, it was about the size of Rhode Island. And the whole thing collapsed uh, within a few weeks. Uh, people, we've gone back there subsequently, and we, uh, we can see what's in the, in the ocean sediment underneath there. And people ask, well, when was the last time that there was open water here? And the answer was 10,000 years ago, right? So, not... Is that the Larson video? Yes, it is, Larson B, yeah. Um, and uh, what you have is, is signs that what, what's happening to the planet is not just important on a 10-year, 20-year, 30-year timescale, but on, on a 100-year timescale, on a 1,000-year timescale, on a 10,000-year timescale. That's geologically important. And for geologists, that's, that's a really big deal. Other things are going on. Like this is in the Arctic, so we're switching to the pole. This was in 2007. Um, this is uh, a, a, a satellite view again. This is this Greenland here, right? This is North America, Alaska. Uh, and this is a picture of the summer sea ice. So this is in the middle of August uh, in 2007. And normally, normally what, what, what used to be normal, uh, this entire area here, where it's black now, that used to be covered in ice, right? Even during the summertime, this whole area was covered in ice. One of the things that, if any of you have ever read, you know, stories of Roald Amundsen, who was the, uh, the first person to travel through the Northwest Passage, 